You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 449. Do or do not. There is no try. Yoda, Jedi Master. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Today on the show, guys, we have returning champion Ben Yenny. Now, Ben is a film distribution expert and has been on the show multiple times talking about film distribution. One of my favorite subjects. Now, in this episode, we're going to talk about what is going on currently from his point of view in the film distribution game with COVID and what's going on. And he just opened up his own distribution company and is doing some really cool things with that. So we wanted to dig into what it's like right now on the street during these turbulent times in film distribution. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Ben Yenny. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, Ben Yenny. How are you doing, Ben? <laughs> Very well, Alex. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> Absolutely. As, as I think this is your third time yeah third time right but you have the distinct uh distinct honor of being my very first interview ever on indie film hustle not the first release but i think you were the first interview i ever did if i remember correctly i think i might have been uh the third but i was the first that wasn't your own personal friend I think if something, I it's something yeah. like that. I remember you were you're one of the first two or three that got mm-hmm. released. So um, you were you you humbled me by coming onto my little podcast all those years ago. <laughs> and now we're over four hundred episodes, and it's gotten insane. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's been it's been kind of crazy, but you've been you've been busy as well. Um, for everybody listening, uh, Ben is a, an amazing was an amazing sales rep, but has since jumped over to uh, the, to the I guess to the good side of the force. It all depends on how you look at it, uh, and become and became a full blown distributor, which we're going to get into as well. But uh, we're, I wanted to bring you back on the show, man, to talk about. <laughs> Um, it's the insane times we're living in uh, and how they're affecting our business. So uh, how has it, how has COVID affected film sales from your point of view domestically and internationally? Uh, it's 
a weird mix for COVID. Um, it's much more affordable to be starting a uh, sales and distribution company uh, because we don't have to worry about market fees, which also means that we don't claim them as the hoops, but we uh, don't have to worry about actually traveling to Berlin Fran- and France and even LA for me now. Um, we just jump on Zoom calls a, a lot. And... Um, Beyond that, we've also been able to get a lot of development executives on the phone a lot more easily than we think we would have. Although, on the same note, uh, we had a big pitch at one of the big pl- big kids TV channels uh, the day that everything shut down in LA in March. And if that had uh, if that had gone differently, I think we would have. I think they would have bought that film, which ended up not happening. But, of course, because the internet yeah. went upside down at that on that at that moment. Oh, indeed. Yeah. So that was a uh, <laughs> that was less uh, than ideal. But we're still in talks with a lot of people about that. Just takes so, longer than we would have expected. So the thing is that that's the that's one area that I've I've always had to. I had a real big sticking point is those fees, those market fees that you need to recoup as a distributor. And they're mm-hmm. still charging them now, even though there are no market fees, arguably. I mean, AFM cost what this year to go in virtually? It didn't cost much at all, did it? I think uh, we went as we had both a booth and everyone on my team had buyer badges because they were completely free. Um, the booth was something like five or six hundred dollars right. um and we got a bit of a, the our total cost was right around 900 and we included a bit of mailchimp subscription in that too right so, so then so let's say a grant let's say a grand total yeah which is generally a, a price of doing business as a distributor you generally wouldn't pass yeah. that on to this to to your filmmakers uh but before how much did it cost to go to afm uh i've had booths before uh the very cheap end of it is thirty five hundred dollars which is just for the booth that's not including any advertising which or or, or travel or food or if you bring somebody else and all that stuff so it could it could go up to comfortably five to ten thousand and if you get bigger booths it could go up to fifty or hundred thousand oh easily yeah um yeah, it's a it, it is much more affordable to get started now. Um, but I'm sure you know on this front because it's something that you've talked about on both in your book and a lot of podcasts that uh, the floor for com- when it's that cheap to get started, the competition becomes really intense really quickly if you don't know what you're doing with it. And so, that so it's a bit of a double edged sword. So right now, so that's another thing you're seeing. You're seeing a lot of distributing startups coming up really quickly now as before it's like any part of our business like before it used to be a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars for a camera and now you can make a film with you know for under five grand comfortably with a you know a beautiful 4k image on a black magic let's say or even on a red uh some of the smaller reds you can go for under 10 grand so it, it now allows a lot of people to get into the business but now the competition becomes a lot more so the same problem that filmmakers are having with distributors distributors are having with themselves <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, it's a um, I mean, it's not as much of a problem because so much of being successful in this business is, is based on relationships <laughs> and long standing relationships. And those aren't something that uh, really ever had a dollar value attached to them, except that you had to pay travel to these places. So it's the biggest thing I actually worry about for the long term uh, health of the industry health of the industry as it stands right now is uh, finding a good entry point for the bigger platforms. And if markets like AFM have a big sea change in them, I worry about where you could actually go to start to come up if you haven't done anything yet. As a distributor? As a distributor or a filmmaker, frankly, um, I started going to AFM as a filmmaker and then became a producer's rep. And then now I'm a distributor. And Mm -hmm something of a sales agent too. Um, but we just got a partner on that to take some of that off my shoulders because I was doing too much. Um, but yeah, I don't think that I, I, the biggest thing about becoming a successful filmmaker is 
hitting the point where you're actually broken enough that you can get attention and get an agent if you want to go the studio route, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to the more film entrepreneur route, which I know you advocate and I do too. Mm-hmm. But um, and I don't know what the path for that would be now that there isn't something like the AFM where you can actually meet people who can get your film on Showtime, or if you're a distributor, you can find those. Uh, you can establish those relationships with those buyers so you can be that junction point. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It, so. must, it must, yeah, I, I understand because I've been to AFM a bunch of times and I, I get that. Like you just run into people, you have dinners, you meet people at parties, you make those relationships, you start, you know, you start building rapport and that takes time, it takes years. Um, like I think originally when we first started talking years ago, uh, you were telling me that like when you show up to AFM, um, no one's really going to do business, real business with you for a few years until they are like, oh, this guy's still <laughs> – showing up he's not a fly by night and and it you know takes those years of time where now that that avenue at least as 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 of this recording is not there do you th- i mean i mean i had jonathan wolf on the other day on on the show as well to talk about the future of it of afm and markets in general i mean i think personally i think they will come back in one way shape or form but they were hurting prior to mm-hmm. covid they were hurting prior to covid so i'm not sure how you know how what well, you and i knew i don't think we're gonna go back there do you agree yeah I, I i completely agree i don't think that it's going to ever be what it was but i mean all of the old timers i know in the business have been saying it's not what it was since i started going and um i mean like the Apparently during like the uh, 80s and early 90s, it was basically printing money because if you had access to a VHS player, you could just hand over fist, man. I mean, and then DVD, everything became much less expensive, but people were still making so much money on physical media that it was a great time to be in sales and distribution. And then when the bottom fell out after 2008, it's been a lot rougher since then Mm -hmm. and i'm sure you know this too this is something that i believe i've heard on your podcast once or twice i i do still actually listen to your podcast Uh, and i I appreciate that sir thank you um Uh, yeah no i I agreed agreed i I mean i i always tell people and there is still place for physical media no question um but it's not what it was and it's niche it's much, much more niche um, for for physical media, and I think overseas there's still physical media is still somewhat of a thing, or is it not? I, I'm not sure how much physical media is overseas anymore. Depends on the territory more than anything. Um, like the territories that are more technologically repressed, there's still a little bit of it. Except there's a really interesting story in Africa as a territory in that they just kind of skipped televisions altogether. So they're straight on mobile and VOD. They just skipped physical media for a lot of the populace, which is interesting into a, itself, but it is uh, it doesn't help your physical media numbers. I mean, Mutiny is doing okay with physical media still. We've got three Walmart releases coming up in the next four months. And uh, one of those also has Best Buy as for exclusive for Blu-ray because it's a horror movie and we know how horror likes their physical media. Um, And... But the only reason that we're able to do that is that we have an output partnership with... uh, yeah, I can say the name uh, with Mill Creek. Um, and if we didn't have that, we would not be doing those wide releases there because the returns are terrible. And if you make one wrong move on that, it can bankrupt you. Well, that, that was going to say, I've, I've talked about this a lot um, in my course and I think even in my book that the, the, the Walmart – idea the the myth of a walmart release or a best buy release is that like oh my god they just bought you know i just sold three thousand units um mm-hmm. but but they get to return anything that doesn't sell right and you that could really hurt a distribution it's not even it's not even that they uh buy them and then you might return them it's that they can sign them oh. so you have to pay to replicate sometimes 20,000 units 
and that's on you until they sell there and that is brutal um whereas so, why even, but, so as a distributor why why do that so like let's say so let's say walmart let's say um my film on the corner of ego and desire so let's say i had a walmart deal and walmart and i'm going through mutiny uh your, your distribution company and they go look walmart wants twenty thousand units they really think it's gonna sell because it's sundance and a lot of people are gonna go to buy this blu-ray at, at, at walmart because it's a sundance time and all this kind of stuff um and uh and you and you actually you incur the cost because the filmmaker is not generally incurring that cost. Is, or am I wrong on that? Um, we charge it as an un, uh, again. We deal through Mill Creek, so we don't actually have to bear that cost. That's part of why we deal with Mill Creek on this. Mm -hmm. But they also take a huge slice of the pie for taking on that risk. And right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so that makes so makes sense. So then, they so they take the the cost. Let's say they they buy twenty thousand or they replicate twenty thousand of the movie. If if fifteen DVDs are sold, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the rest of them are just like, sorry, we 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 can't use them, and they return them, then you and Mill Creek have to eat that cost, right? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Uh, okay. One of the other things about dealing with Mill Creek is extremely established in this. They've got, I think, over 18,000 titles that they've released. So that having that, that weight um, behind them, push, it does help a lot, which also means that they uh, the unsold discs for them do go to places like Dollar General or Big Lots or anything like that. So you don't. You still lose a little bit per unit, but instead of losing like a buck twenty-five, you're losing twenty-five cents, which makes all the difference in the world when you're dealing in numbers that big. Um, a nickel, a nickel's a lot of money at that point. Every nickel you can <laughs> save is good, right? Yeah. Because the big lots will buy five thousand units at a buck a piece, and then they'll sell it for three ninety-nine or two ninety-nine in their stores. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. So that's how uh, that's part of how they're able to cut risk, and that's the only way that this model makes sense right now. Um, mm -hmm. And frankly, if it were just us, we wouldn't do it. We would uh, we deliver to Redbox on our own, and we but also. Deliver... But that's a straight up buyout, though, right? Like they buy. Oh, that's just straight up buyout, and you only have to replicate discs. Which gets yeah no covers way yeah no yeah covers. Um, you need spindles it, <laughs> exactly and um, the uh, we also when we're not dealing with Mill Creek which is somewhat rare we can also deliver to some of the smaller chains like Midwest Tape and uh, uh, Family Video in places like they, that Family Video just shut down though didn't they. Did they? I am embarrassed. Yeah. I missed that. Um, yeah, they just. I saw an article that came out. Family video shit. Like they just they're shutting their stores, which is sad. Yeah, I know. Um, that's a. Uh, well, we were dealing with family video, and they. Uh, I knew they had shut down in Canada. I didn't realize that they shut down in the U.S. too. But that makes sense. It doesn't seem like a safe time. Yeah. It, it was. It, look, um, they had a video store chain that was still working. Like that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I, and I'm. Yeah, now I again this is actually as I'm hearing about it, and I'm a little sad. But uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to break the news yeah. on air, sir. Um I just saw it fly by. I was like, oh, family video. No. Like you know, that was the last hope. But there's still that last blockbuster. Don't forget there's that last blockbuster you can still <laughs> sell one or two units to. <laughs> is that in Washington or Alaska? No, Alaska's shut down. It's the one in Washington, I think. Yeah, the Alaska okay. one shut down because that was the one that uh Lewis Oliver <laughs> Uh, or John Oliver sent the cod piece from Russell Crowe's cod piece from um, from Cinderella Man as a way to drive people into the store and save it, and it didn't work. Um, so there is one more blockbuster left in the United States that's still alive, um, and it's now become a, a tourist attraction. It's just you could actually Airbnb there. By the way, you can sleep, you can Airbnb you can sleep over and and sleep in. Like, I would absolutely sleep in a blockbuster overnight you are not alone i would do that too so they're figuring I, it out they're figuring out what to do because it's obviously the rentals is not the biggest thing so they're trying to build up other and i'm going to have the director of the movie on soon um they directed the documentary on called the last blockbuster um which is doing really well as well but um but yeah so so i wanted everyone listening to understand the physical media gambit mm -hmm. it's still there but there's some 
there's yeah it's a little it's a little weird to say the least yeah and i mean the big reason we do it and the big reason that we uh still seek out these deals is just that having that physical presence does have an impact on your vod sales as well just the fact that people going to the store if they see it on on an end cap even if they don't buy it there which is generally what we ideally want them to do they're more likely to click through and buy it if they happen to see it when they're browsing movies on itunes or amazon or wherever else we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show so that's why we keep pushing that, even though it comes out at better than a wash, but not significantly better than a wash. When we're talking about all the money that is a potential between all of the returns, uh, Mill Creek's cut and the other things there, I am not uh, – it's – not as much money as you think it is. Like I, <laughs> so you were saying you still work with Redbox. How robust is Redbox's business model at this point? Are they still like growing? And I mean, I still see their kiosks everywhere, and I think they are the only guys who figured out how to do physical media properly because there's mm-hmm. just no overhead. Like it's barely any overhead. So that's why mm-hmm. they're able to do. And it's no, there's no employees. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no there's nothing it's just a machine so how are how how robust is it and, and how are the sales going to them so we had a red box it's not exactly a red box exclusive but it's a red box early release that happened earlier this month mm-hmm. and uh this was a small film with hardly with uh no extremely notable cast in it but um it had uh the first week it was out, it did. The first day it was out, it was number four at Redbox Nationwide and number five er, and number one in horror for the entire week. And then nationwide on the rental charts, the first week it was number twelve, which is it's huge. It's huge. yeah, and that's just Redbox. So that is something that. Uh, in that film is I am Lisa because that's already out. I can say that. Um, but the but it will be going to one of these other things later. And thanks to how well it did on Redbox, we've actually been able to get some international traction with it too. So it is. A- what is a typical deal? Um, like what is a typical buy on on a Redbox deal? Like five five thousand units, three thousand units, a thousand units. Thirty five thousand. Thirty five thousand units. Yes, is the full buy. Is that the um, full buy? Do they do partial buys or, or? They will do. The least I've seen is a half buy, and Still uh, that is yeah, seventeen yeah, five, seventeen five to twenty somewhere in that range. Um, they also do double buys. Um, so that's oh, to have extra copies. To have extra copies because they have about forty thousand kiosks in the country. So wow, they're forty thousand kiosks. No yeah. wonder. No wonder. So they have to fill those kiosks. Even so, in and if you're buying, and if you're doing, you're replicating. So you're doing all the replication, but they're buy. If you're if you're replicating twenty, they're thirty five thousand DVD, DVDs, right, or Blu-rays, or does it matter? Yeah, DVDs. Uh, they DVDs. don't do well. They have Blu-rays from us. I don't know if they actually do offhand. So, so if it's um, so, so if it's let's say thirty thousand, thirty five thousand DVDs, I'm assuming you get those for. 75 cents 50 cents yeah no nah, it's more like uh do, when you're dealing in that volume it's more like anywhere between 17 and 25 cents a day even geez. so uh, yeah yeah and then and then and, and then buying them out i don't know if you, you you could tell me alex i can't tell you that number but what is a general <laughs> like is there a ratio give me like a just because i'm just curious maybe i'll mm-hmm. ask you off air but i'm just curious <laughs> Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that number publicly, okay. so I would be, uh, I, I, I should not, I, yeah, given Should've, I don't know. Then, then, then don't say that number publicly, but, the, but you yeah. can still see that there's a profitable, there's some profit. There. Oh, it's very profitable. Yeah, it's, um, a very, it's a profitable, it's a profitable place and it's a buy. So if you could get a red box deal as an independent filmmaker, you're in a good place. Oh yeah. It's a lot harder to, that, right now than it used to be. They are also feeling a bit of the crunch too. Um, they used to buy about four times as many titles a month as they do now. 
So that is that can be difficult. Um, and but we seem to be doing decently well with it. So, um, but we are. I would take. Uh, Redbox deals are among the most profitable domestic distribution deals that exist right now. So, I would imagine because God knows uh, Amazon isn't. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and I want to, I want, I want to put something to rest here, and I want, I want someone like yourself to say it publicly on air with me. Tvod is dead for independent filmmakers unless you can drive traffic to the platform that you're doing the transactional to, and there, and that, and traffic of of customers who are willing to purchase or rent your film. Is that a fair statement? <laughs> Yes. However, if you can drive enough people there to buy your movie Mm -hmm. to actually get picked up in the algorithm, you can get spillover sales from it. It's just, but you have to do those upfront numbers for it to work at all. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. With 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 iTunes and Amazon and all those. Yeah. If you can get into the top hundred. And then if you get into the top mm-hmm. 50 and then if you can get in, in the top 10 of a category, not even the top 10 of all of iTunes, then, mm-hmm. then the algorithm will pick you up and, and kind of give you a little bit more of a boost. But that's mm-hmm. that's not easy. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, it's, it's, not and at most, all. And, and most filmmakers don't have that sophistication in audience or targeting or marketing or the research like it's a rarity to find filmmakers that have an audience and in the kind of movie that hits and and you know it's it's Mm -hmm. rare from my experience just doing what i do all these years i don't see it very often does it happen yes but someone won the lottery the other day so you know it happens but (laughs) it wasn't by the way it wasn't me i didn't win the billion dollars so uh if anybody was just wondering, I'm sure I'm sure you didn't. You probably wouldn't be on this call, sir, if you would have won. <laughs> I'd be buying my own private Cayman Island and just exactly. retiring. But and the, I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I would see. I'm out, bitches, and just drop the mic and just run. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, because a lot of a lot of filmmakers still think that TVOD is is an option, and they they. They spent all this money on aggregators, getting their films up on iTunes and Amazon and Google Play and God forbid Fandango and PlayStation and Xbox, which, I mean, it, it's so rare to generate revenue there unless it's a specific kind of title, but you really need to drive an audience. Do you agree? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, the two that I've seen the best with from more of a, honestly, from more of a producer's rep uh, place, because we haven't really started our VOD launches besides Amazon at Mutiny yet, but I've seen a lot of back-end reporting uh, from my time as a producer's rep. I was surprised. Um, second to Amazon, um, YouTube and Fandango were often towards the top for the films that were going out through these aggregators. Um iTunes was hit or miss. Oh no, Amazon. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, iTunes is not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I heard from somebody I've worked with a couple times that uh, apparently, even for distributors who get much cheaper aggregation rates than standard filmmakers do, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times when you aggregate to iTunes, I think it's something like eight and ten don't even make their aggregation feedback. Which is oh. a pr- atrocious, really. Eight, uh, only eight of ten. I would think it would be nine point five out of ten. I, I mean, it's it's like yeah. a, that's why I always tell people, like, okay, uh, should I should I spend two thousand bucks to get my film up on uh, on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play? I'm like, do you think your mm-hmm. your movie is going to make two thousand dollars in transactional in all of those platforms in the next thirty to ninety days? If you say yes go for it if you say no why in god's green earth i would spend that money print dvds and sell them out of the back of your truck yeah (laughs) like go go door to door go to flea markets i mean you're gonna make more money you're gonna make more money doing that you might well you're right i mean like i (laughs) yeah it's it's ridiculous how hard it is to actually make 
enough to move the needle enough that you can make any significant money from any single platform, which is why Amazon is just kind of the default because it doesn't cost anything to get you up there. But but the thing is that with Amazon, it doesn't cost anything to get up there. And also, and everyone listening, I want you to understand too that um, – the reason why you want to have your, your film up on an Amazon or an iTunes is because people feel comfortable. All they have to do is click a button. Their information, the credit card information is there. That's why I always go against Vimeo or Gum or Gumroad or those mm-hmm. kind of platforms for films because you're like you're asking someone to put their credit card in. You, there's too many layers of entry, mm-hmm. uh, you know, blocking the entry. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show to like give you a reason not to do it. But with Amazon, it's a click. iTunes, it's a click. Even Google, mm-hmm. if you're if you're, it's a click. YouTube is a click. It, it all depends if, on where you feel comfortable. It makes sense to put it on those platforms. But if you can't drive traffic, man, it's it's useless. But with Amazon specifically, you know, I want you to tell people why they're paying everybody. It's only a penny. Now for the work, like, you know, it's a penny per hour streamed. And that's, Mm -hmm. I think from my understanding is like the 50% point. Like if you hit like a certain point in the algorithm or the engagement, if you're under 50%, it's a penny. If you go 50 to 60, it's like two pennies. Like to get like the magical 11 or 12 cents, you got to be like essentially Avengers. (laughs) Yeah. And you've got to be like, you've got to be driving so much actually engaged traffic to watch your movie that most filmmakers will never realize anything more than the cent per hour mark. Um, Specifically when I said Amazon, though, I was actually talking about Amazon on T-Bot. Amazon on T-Bot. Yeah. Yeah. If you're doing uh, transactional through Amazon, that almost always makes sense for a window. For F-Bot, there's more you could talk about. But the – the biggest thing you can do to help yourself on Amazon, um, either for transactional or SVOD, mm-hmm. is uh, get all of your friends to watch and or buy the content as close to release time as possible. And actually watch it through if even if they've already bought it or seen it somewhere else or like play in the background yeah, somewhere personal screening just leave it somewhere while you do something else let it play there that will actually help you rise through those rankings at least a little bit i mean again unless you have that kind of a vendor's money it's going to be really hard to get to the point that you're making anything really really good in terms of money and I don't think it's ever going to – yeah. Would you recommend – if someone had $1,000 for marketing, mm-hmm. do you recommend c- calling all of your friends, everybody, and go, rent, buy the movie, watch it all the way through, send me proof that you purchased it and watched it all the way through, leave a review, and I will refund your money? So that way there's an absolute engagement. You're paying for mm-hmm. the engagement, and, and that way at least it kind of boosts it up a bit. I'm not even sure if a thousand will even blink it, make a blink of it, but it might do something to get it into the algorithm. If it did, if that would happened over the, over your launch weekend, that might move the needle a bit, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say that uh, Amazon might well know that it's you doing that if that happens. Uh, but if it's with, with if it's different accounts though, it's different people's accounts, different all, all around the country. I mean, I hope that that is – yes, that is true, um, but uh, I don't know – so we've actually had several of our filmmakers who were trying to rate their own movie and also get their friends to rate their own movie that actually had their uh, – they were no longer able to do ratings for that title at all. And that is a thing that happens, mm-hmm. and I believe what you're talking about here, Alex, um, might actually be against the TOS on Amazon, but who hey, actually – it's like a- I'm just trying. I'm just trying to hack. Yeah. I'm just trying to hack the system, sir. So yeah. I, I'm not sure if it's a, it's legal, not legal. I, I, you know, according to yeah. Amazon, I'm just trying to help a filmmaker. Out. But hey, oh, no, I, I completely agree. I would not be a. I would never do anything like that. I would never do or advise would, anything such as that. But I would yes. never do anything like that, sir. That would be wrong. But there are people out there that might, and we're just floating a balloon. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, uh, I wanted to ask you, There's this big, there's been a big hoo-ha-ha about Warner Brothers and HBO Max's new release strategy. It is... It is split Hollywood down the middle. I'd love to hear what you think about what they're doing uh, and and how do you think it's going to affect things moving forward. And for everyone listening, if you don't know what Warner Brothers has done, they're releasing all of their theatrical big movies in the theaters and on HBO Max at the same time and you don't need to pay any more on HBO Max it's included so Wonder Woman was the first big test of that then every month you know I think Godzilla versus uh, Kong The Matrix and I don't know about Dune I think they're fighting Dune um, there's so many of these movies that are coming out like this um, what do you think is going to happen I think theaters have been in trouble for a bit, and I think that, uh, especially with COVID, we're going to see a massive change in that infrastructure uh, coming very, very soon. Several of the big chains might not come back um, at all, which is which means that studios have to experiment and try new things here. From a consumer perspective uh i think that removing the barrier for people who are worried about the coronavirus to see your content uh and legitimately worried about it um i think it's the smart play from a humanitarian perspective and i think that there is going to be goodwill that's generated from that And I think the people who are really, really, really into your IP are still going to go out to the theater. Um, I'm going to go. I want to see a Marvel movie in the theaters. I want to see. I want to see Bond in the theaters. Like I don't want to see it at home only. I don't want to see Top Gun at home. I don't want to see the new Top Gun. I don't want to. I mean, I will, but Mm -hmm. I'm also not going to risk my health or my family's health to go see a movie. That's me personally. Mm-hmm. I know there's others that don't feel that way. And I also live in Los Angeles, which is the epicenter as, as of this recording. So it's a little bit, you know, maybe some other places in the country in the middle of Wyoming somewhere. It's not that big of a deal. But where I'm li- living, it's a little bit more of a risk. Mm-hmm. But but it's it's very interesting how the, the mindset is changing because now f- – people are going to almost expect it it's going to be it's going to be like you're changing everyone's mind or changing everyone's model of how they consume the content Mm -hmm. now you got to tell me like in a year or two the studios are going to try to change it back it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be tough and and you were saying the theaters were in trouble if if for the last 10 years it's been it's been going on a steady decline slowly Mm -hmm. if you pull marvel out of the mm-hmm. magical experience, theaters would have never survived. That it, look at the yeah. numbers. Just look at the yeah. numbers. Without Marvel movies, specifically Marvel movies, which is they released, I don't know, 20 films, they are responsible for, I don't know what, 35, 40% of the box office over the last decade. It's insanity. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. If, and if you pull out Disney, if you pull out Disney total, then they're responsible for 60%, 65% of all box office. So it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, going in a good direction in the first mm-hmm. place. And for generations like you and me, uh, w- you know, we grew up with theaters. We grew up mm-hmm. going to the big screen. You know, my kids, they like the movie theater, but they're just as happy watching it at home. Mm-hmm. And it's sad, but it's just the way people... I mean, I don't want to watch... Top Gun on my iPhone. That's wrong. <laughs> I agree. I, mean, I don't even think my big TV with my seven with my seven one surround sound is adequate for Top Gun. Frankly, um, you need a screen. I need I need like a, a personal like Quentin Tarantino screening room <laughs> to enjoy like you know a bit like a real projector, a real screening room to be able to to enjoy something like that at home. And I'm not rolling that deep just yet so i can't afford that at the moment <laughs> soon but not just yet um but it's 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 really interesting to see how 
our business is just changing. And whatever happens at the top, which is at the studio level, it is going to trickle down to you guys, to the, to the, to the, you know, B and C and, and smaller distributors. Um, mm-hmm. Because before theatrical was a tough sell for independent films, period. Right? Mm-hmm. Before COVID. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, we did. Yeah, you did some theatricals. We did four last year. Um, and that's a, uh, and I mean, we did them specifically for uh, press. That was really it. Because if you actually have any degree of press, any degree of a screening in a local market, you can generally get it reviewed, which helps it get discovered online because they link back and it's all about SEO at that point. Um, we are still looking at doing a couple this year, but pretty much everything we're doing now is geared more towards virtual cinema because a lot of times it will actually help to soothe that need and there's not the health risk involved. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. There are a couple times we're looking at uh, actually doing a physical one because of the title. Uh, One we just closed today uh, that I don't want to say the name of yet, but we're actually doing a full day and date with it. Um, But we're not going to be releasing it for free anywhere on that day and date. It's going to be theaters, virtual cinema, and some other platforms with the same day as theaters. And because explain, can you explain to everybody what virtual cinema is? So virtual cinema can mean a couple of different things, but in general, it's a partnership with a theater chain that uh, enables you, that is essentially just premium video on demand. But because it's partnered with a theater chain, uh, you can report it as box office to places like the numbers and box office mojo. And that starts to make a difference uh, for international sales and other things. And that's part of why we've been using this model. Um The other thing from us is the virtual cinema model we use when we're partnering with local independent theaters as theaters as opposed to a big chain like Longley or Alamo AMC or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. What they have their own platforms, but when you're partnering with the local guys, we do it through Vimeo OTT and we just create a separate product that is film name at theater name dot com at theater name and we give the theater 50 percent of the take for sending it out and we keep the rest but we also capture the emails for that exact sort of uh consumer type so if we're selling horror movies in to a theater in kansas all of a sudden we have a list of uh horror consumers in kansas which helps a so lot. huge so huge yeah that's interesting you see it's it's fascinating to see how you know the smart distributors are trying to you gotta maneuver you've got to do something you gotta you can't just sit around and wait for dvd Mm -hmm. sales from walmart like it's like it's 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 Mm -hmm. a constant change and that's why i wanted to have you on because i wanted to see what you were doing and what you know you you got you definitely got your nose to the grindstone on what's going on you got your, your hand on the pulse of what's going on like daily and the thing is changing daily like it's almost weekly or monthly there's something new happening you know something else is going to happen or or there's a new model or there's a new thing like you know who, who would have told if i would have told you last year drive-ins were going to be a thing you would have laughed in my face <laughs> but drive th- drive-ins have become i think one of the biggest revenue generators right now right For, if biggest, you have to- yeah i will say that i've always loved drive-ins mm-hmm. but after the pandemic goes away, I don't think they're going to stick around, no. which, no. yeah. No, but no. They were nostalgic to begin with. They're like nostalgic, <laughs> you know, squared. Because theaters are nostalgic. <laughs> and then like drive-in theaters are even more nostalgic. I mean, it's like, like I really want to go to a video store, but I only want to rent VHS. Like, okay, you're now you're going to <laughs> multiple <laughs> levels of nostalgia here, sir. <laughs> only, I only I only watch beta tapes, like Betamax. That's the only uh, thing I rent is Betamax. So... <laughs> Hey, laser disc man! Don't forget hey, about laser. Hey, I just sold my laser disc collection, and I'm still kind of sad about it. I just, it was <laughs> sitting there. I had all my Criterion's, and I had my laser disc player from high school that still worked. And I just like, it's. I'm never gonna watch this. Why? Let me just. And I, I sold it for a few hundred bucks to a collector, and I it must have been easily like two, three thousand dollars for the 
laser discs back in the day retail. And it's, you know, so if I got anything for it, I was happy. Um, now, uh, another big question I get asked all the time is how relevant are film festivals anymore to the distribution model or marketing or things like that? My feeling has always been that they've been going down. It's not, I think, I think film festivals are still riding high off the 90s. The relevance of film festivals in the 90s, which was the Sundance movement. And that's when film festivals became kind of rock stars because before the 90s, there's no film festivals in the 80s that mattered. I mean, it can, obviously, in Berlin and some of the bigger, older, you know, more established film festivals. But there wasn't like 5,000 film festivals in the U.S. back then. <laughs> and filmmakers still have that mentality that film festivals are where I'm going to get found by a distributor. You're a distributor. Do mm-hmm. you look for film festivals? Do you look at, I mean, obviously you probably do look at film festivals, but is it, if I if I won Best Picture at Mo- the Internet, Moose Jaw International Film Festival, which I don't think that's a real festival. If I won that festival, I'm, I won Best Picture at the Moose Jaw International Film Festival. I could put those laurels. Do you give a crap? <laughs> Does it put anything to the bottom line? Um, it doesn't really put anything to the bottom line, no. Unless you're doing the uh, top, let's say, 20 um, yeah. film fests in the world, it doesn't really matter that much to a distributor. Um, I actually wrote a blog on this about my site specifically about why uh, your why you won't get distribution from your festival run. I think it's almost exactly that title, uh, which is more there, but the gist of it is what you're covering. There are too many festivals, there are too many films being made, and distributors don't have the time to track all of them. Um, now, to largely reverse what I just said, uh, Mutiny actually has a uh, invitation-only uh, festival first look program. Mm-hmm. So we'll partner with a festival... And if the filmmaker opts in, we'll review their movie and we'll take and we'll make a what we think to be a fair offer for it. Um, and we do that because part of this game being successful as a distributor is about finding the best content as early as you can. Because anything that's really in demand, there's going to be competition for. There will be multiple offers for. Pretty much everything I chase, somebody else has an offer in on as well. And um, most of the time, I have to uh, not so subtly say why these other people, why we're better than these other people. Um, so you just uh, you just send them you just send them over to the uh, our uh, protect yourself from predatory film distributors uh, Facebook group and go do a search for their name on that group and let me know what you find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't actually done that yet, but I probably will. Like, you should, you should, de- you should definitely do <laughs> that, sir. It's, it, it's, it, it, it's an easy. You don't have to say. You don't have to be the bad guy. I'm like, no, let's just, just go look. You know, there's a oh, oh that bit, oh that other big guy who loves to buy independent films who will remain nameless. Oh, that guy. Oh, just go over and do a search for them in that group and see how, see how that worked out for, for a lot of the people. That that's that's a good call. Um, <laughs> I'm here to help. So, I'm here to help, Ben. I'm here to. Help. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so on that same level, we try to be ethical about that because most of the time, when you get a distribution offer from a festival, you should run. Um, they're from really bad. Th- they do happen. Are you familiar with this? I've heard oh. of it, vaguely heard of it, but it's just such an obscure, weird thing. <laughs> like the only festival that I know of that has a real release situation at Sundance. Like they mm-hmm. will pick up a film and they will release it through their, through their banner and they, you know, Sundance TV. And I have, I know filmmakers who've gone down that road and, but that's kind of mm-hmm. like a lottery ticket. It's like a 24 picking up your film. Like they pick mm-hmm. up 12 movies a year or 13 movies a year. Like it's very selective. Yeah. Um, so the ones that I've seen and I ran into this a fair amount as a rep, um, <laughs> It's almost like they're white labeling dist- disturber. I think some of them actually at the time were just white labeling disturber, which and then taking you still make those you still pay those fees, and they also take something an absurd amount of the take on it. Oh, so it's that's a, that's, it's a, that's a new one. I it doesn't surprise me, but I hadn't heard that specific situation. So for everyone mm-hmm. listening uh, who is not familiar with what the, the words that are coming out of Ben's mouth, um, it's basically this. A film festival will say, hey, we're a film festival X, distrib- and we're gonna, we, we'll distribute your movie under our banner. 
film distribution X company. And all they'll do is call up Distribber or a film aggregator. And if you don't know who Distribber is, just do a search for Distribber on Google and you'll find a lot about them and probably see my face there. Um, then uh, then they'll pay for – then they'll, they'll charge you – what they're going to get paid charged to put their films up on iTunes, Amazon and whatever. And for the pleasure of that, they'll also take 35% or 25% or something like that. Yeah. That's so abusive. It's not even funny. <laughs> no, that is very much what happens. And that, that ha- I've seen those sorts of things. I can't confirm that it was a full white label of that, but given what they were offering and given how long I've been in this game, it looked at hell of a lot like that's what they were doing um am i allowed to swear on your podcast alex uh, yeah, generally i don't like it but if you want to throw a couple f-bombs in i'll allow it <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so that is a uh i will try to uh refrain from george carlin's be- uh most famous bit <laughs> um it's, yes we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor And now back to the show. But um, so, yeah, that is so the reason we do that and the the film festivals we target are the sort that um, attract the content that our biggest domestic buyers are looking for. Like we generally know what Showtime's looking for because we're really close with them. We know what Stars is looking for for the same reason. And uh, same for Redbox, same for all of these. So in order to help us better find this content so that we can sift through and get the ones that we know we can really do well with and make sure the filmmaker does well out of as well, Mm -hmm. it just allows us to uh, find those people more quickly by having those relationships with the festivals. So, so. there's like, so like some genre festivals, like some horror festivals or things like that. Cause there's, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's an easier sell for you with your, de- your distribution model mm-hmm. connections and things like that. You can sell that fairly easily. But if I exactly. have, but if I have a period drama um, with no stars in it, um, it's going to be a little bit difficult to sell. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Um, <laughs> to say depends the least. on which period. Like, if you were able to make, let's say, a Roman epic for ten grand, and it doesn't look like total crap, yeah, I'm pretty sure I could sell that. Oh no, you could sell that. Yeah, I'm saying, okay, let's uh, 70s, the 70s, uh, 70s inside an apartment melodrama, no stars, decent production. Decent production, mm-hmm. solid production, mm-hmm. um, acting solid. Let's just say in the right. Let's say writing, acting, and production direction all solid. Not like mm-hmm. Scorsese, nineteen seventy six, but <laughs> but solid, but solid. Mm-hmm. You're not going to sell that. No, it's going to be really difficult. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Yeah, I I have had to have more conversations about why dramas are hard to sell than I care to on places like. (laughs) I know. I'm doing my best, bro. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best to preach the word, man. I've been I've been yelling at filmmakers. I'm like, don't do a a drama with a movie star is hard to sell. It's just hard. It's hard, (laughs) unless unless it's niche. If you have a niche, oh, yes. If you have a niche, that's a different conversation. But you're talking like a generic, you know, family drama. No, no. Define family. Um, exactly. So, because the family yeah. could be a niche, it could be, you know, mm-hmm. it could be dealing with autism. That's a niche. Mm-hmm. Dealing with, you know, but if it, it, it just, and we don't want to get into the weeds on this, but generally speaking, if it's just a general drama about a family, mm-hmm. you know you know, just doing family stuff in the seventies. It's nah, not, you're, it's not, not going to sell. It's going to be real. It's going to be tough. And I've seen those movies. I've seen $250,000 dramas with no stars in it. And they come to me and they go, what, what do you think we could do with this? And I'm like, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, man, but it's going to be a rough sell. Like, yeah. And like, Oh, we got this deal from this big distributor. I'm like, you're, you're probably never going to see a dime. Um, yes. Yeah, that's, it's sad, it's but it's true. Yeah. It's sad. It's sad, but it's true. Um, 
what do you feel? What 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 are you getting for Avod right now? Like, are you getting? Is Avod turning into a revenue a, a, a real revenue stream for independent film films? Because I know Avod is making a lot of money for <laughs> studios and established movies, but for in your world from independent films, how is it doing? Depends a bit on the on which genre and which niche you're talking about. Um, urban films are doing extremely well, be they independent or. Uh, big studio pictures on avod you just kind of have but in general i'd say that avod is probably going to be the biggest sector of growth in the industry in the next at least year um the uh there was just something that i think i actually saw it in one of your groups um that was to be dropping their numbers and they've seen just gargantuan growth in this and i don't think that growth is really going to go away. Sure, it was aided by the pandemic, and it might go down a little bit after this, but I don't think it's going to really... um, I don't think it's going to completely retract, and I think people are going to be... I think AVOD, for everyone under 35, is going to be the nail in the coffin for uh, traditional cable, is really where it's going. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100%. But the funny thing is, I find about AVOD is like... The advertisers are advertising to people who can't even afford a subscription a lot of times. So mm-hmm. is that going to is that model make sense or is it just more brand awareness? Because if you if, you, if I'm not saying that all people who watch Avod can't afford that. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that. But generally speaking, people who do consume Avod are people who are not purchasing or don't have Disney Plus, HBO, Netflix and Hulu and some other platforms or has cable in general. Mm-hmm. So if I'm advertising a product on Avod that is, you know, higher priced, does that make sense? So I, that's a, that's a much deeper question that I don't think you and I have <laughs> above our pay grade. <laughs> but <laughs> more than likely, but I would put one at least thought process on that. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the biggest ad spenders are companies like Coca Cola. Yeah, and of people can't Love afford a Coke. Coke. It's a um, and other sorts of brands that are at a similar price point to that. So I think that Avod, I think in if TV and they spend tons of money on TV right now, if they're looking to access the key demographic and they're all moving to Avod, I think they're going to start spending money on Avod. Yeah, I know the Super Bowl this year is there. <laughs> there's a lot of people who are not going to advertise, like mm-hmm. Bud- Budweiser. For the first time in 38 years, is not going to advertise on on the, on the Super Bowl. That's yeah, that's definitely a sign of the times. Um, the, uh, that says, and it's beer. Yeah, beer. I, I doubt that beer has taken a hit. Is it beer though? <laughs> The, uh, the 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 views of our guests do not that necessarily represent the views uh, of of the host or the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, but you know what I mean. It's it's alcohol. <laughs> That we can agree upon. It is alcohol. But it's, but yeah, so I doubt that beer is taking a big hit during this time. I, I'm assuming this, I haven't looked at the numbers, but I'm assuming beer and alcohol sales have probably gone up a bit because of what's going on in the world, which is not a good thing. Mm-hmm. But why wouldn't they be advertising there? Could you get for that five and a half million dollars that you're going to have for that one thirty second spot if you threw five and a half mm-hmm. million into an AVOD sequence? Like, Oh how much God, you get so many impressions i can't imagine Ooh. i mean so so think about that like if, if i'm going to spend five and a half million for 30 seconds mind you you're going to have 100 million eyeballs on it or you can have eyeball after eyeball after eyeball for probably months for that price on a oh, tv yeah. and on a pluto and those kind of places it's it's pretty insane I, yeah i mean i like if you use youtube as an example um there's actually pretty decent on this um i think it's something like 10 cent per full video view on youtube 10 cent times like what that's 50 million easily right there views. that's views. yeah views that's actual views that's not counting the skip after six seconds so i imagine we're gonna get a lot of eyeballs i think the the, the whole the whole 
the whole world is changing so fast and so rapidly <laughs> that um, it's just difficult to keep up. And I think independent yeah. filmmakers are just, I just want everyone listening to understand we are not in the 90s anymore. We're not in the early 2000s. We're not even a year ago. <laughs> Mm -hmm. we are in a completely different world and it's changing so rapidly that by the time I know that some people started their movie before COVID with one business model and after it, they're just like, Oh my God, it, that's how fast things are changing. And I do you think, and I, I, I truly believe this is going to happen, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Facebook, someone is going to buy not only some smaller studios because MGM is up for sale now. Oh, yeah. li that library, and I saw that coming. And someone's, mm -hmm. if Apple doesn't buy MGM, I don't even, why wouldn't you? I, That's, I don't yeah. understand why you wouldn't buy MGM at this point. Their library is massive. But they're, they're going to buy out, Sony's probably going to go next. Um, the, the, not the TV, but the theatrical side, because it's been hurt for years. Um, Lionsgate is prime as well. That's another, that's another potential acquisition. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So those acquisitions, but then also would Netflix or a company like Netflix purchase Regal? or AMC and do some sort of mixture. I always said, and I'm not sure mm -hmm. it might be Netflix, but I said if someone like Disney bought AMC, that makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense because now there's a Disney store in every single theater and, mm -hmm. they, can, and they can have Disney themed restaurants inside. Like it becomes a completely different business model because now they're not, it's not about, even about sharing money with the revenue of the movies. It's their movies. It's like, mm -hmm. would, th does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think that from Disney's perspective, I, I can see that entirely. And that's assuming that we just, that we have just stopped caring about antitrust laws, which we have. So that's yeah, it's that's gone. Yeah, that's gone. Yeah, that that, that whole antitrust here. thing is gone. Uh, but the uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense for Disney with someplace like AMC. I'm not 100 percent convinced that Regal is as hurting as AMC is. Um, but AMC is just uh, bigger. They're just a much bigger beast. Yeah, and they also kind of overexpanded for a bit there. So that was the thing, and Regal was not as victim to that so they have a bit they can weather more of a shock than amc could um and so i think disney and amc would make a lot of sense i think that you're right on apple and mgm app i haven't looked at the subscription numbers for apple tv plus lately but i can't imagine they're doing that well on that's a lot that, of that. yeah because they're not taking it seriously yet i don't care yeah. what they say they're not taking it seriously this is kind of like a eh. Apple, for them it's a, it's it's a, it's a line item it's nothing like they're like oh we spent five billion on content that's nothing for apple that's like literally it's like craft services on an independent film like it doesn't mean anything to them but mm -hmm. if they're serious and they want to i think the second that that apple really becomes um they say, you know what? We want to buy Netflix. We mm -hmm. then, when they're serious, I don't know when they're going to be serious, but I think someone, someone's going to do that. <laughs> yeah, and I think that I I was pretty convinced that they were going to buy Netflix a few years ago, but I actually I think the last time I was on this podcast, I was also pretty yeah. convinced. Yeah, of you, it. Said, you said <laughs> the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, but I'm less convinced of it now. Um, they've actually done pretty well out of the pandemic, and they're in less of a dire financial strait than they were. Mm -hmm. um, but I am. Uh, but I do think that in order for Apple TV Plus to actually gain any major traction in the marketplace, you're right. They need to start buying up libraries. They need to look at if they take over MGM's library, they can afford to and put it. A lot of it is exclusive on Apple TV Plus overnight. It's massive. It's massive. Yeah, it's massive. the entire James Bond collection overnight. That's good. that you can run a campaign, an ad campaign on that easily. And just, just, just on that, and they have multiple uh, Rocky. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, there's just so much stuff that they have that they own, and then Lionsgate's another another uh, catalog, mm -hmm. massive. And then you know they drop down five, six, seven billion on it. 
it's not, it, you know, I, I, we're talking about it like you and I rolled like that, but we don't. But, um, but for companies that size, it's, it's not that big of a, that's not that big of a purchase. So it's just all about a bigger conversation. But, um, so, uh, let's talk about why you decide to jump from a producer's rep to a distributor like what because i've only known you as a producer's rep all these years and then all of a sudden you told me that you have a distribution company um so what what made you made the jump um a lot of sales agents and distributor are shifty as hell and no, stop uh, it stop it. i know it's how dare i um but the uh and even as a producer's rep i was it much better like part of the issue is that um there's a massive discrepancy in information for filmmakers versus a sales agent. Having a producer's rep doesn't fully alleviate that, but helps a lot in alleviating that. And especially if the producer's rep is working closely with your lawyer. Um, but the um, but even then, a, pay, a contract is only as good as the people who wrote it. So if you're dealing with a bad disreputable sales agent or distributor even if you get the best contract in the world it's not going to matter that much they don't pay so you. yeah yeah I, I had that i had that one uh, one filmmaker unfortunately who was he's diagnosed with terminal cancer who had mm -hmm. a contract that said that we're going to pay you a hundred thousand dollar mg and he spent all his money getting the deliverables ready sold his car because oh i got a hundred g's coming then never got paid Still, still, so it doesn't and that matter. One, and that one's actually a pretty easy one to enforce because it's an actual MG as far as these go. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, I mean, I'm speaking comparably. It's obviously he's having trouble, and I don't remember if I actually heard that whole podcast, mm -hmm. but it is, but it's much easier to chase down an MG or a license than it is to chase down royalty payments mm -hmm. is the big part that I'm going for there. And um, most independent films just don't get an MG or a license for it. And if you're in the producer's rep position of constantly having to pound sales agents and distributors for even just reports, not even money necessarily, just reports, it, it, I realized with how much of my time I was spending on uh, – I realized that I'd really like to get more into direct distribution and then the opportunity presented itself where some of my favorite people to work with found themselves without companies. So we made one ourselves. So and that makes, that's that where makes. it yeah. So, so how um, how do you guys do uh, releases? How do you release during this insane time, your films? Uh, we take it a little bit on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but we always try to emphasize our uh, – we always try to bring the things we do best to every release we have. And the things we do best are – deep relationships to big pay TV providers and big physical media retailers, as well as publicity. We're really good at publicity. Um, we've only been around since June, which as of this recording is about seven months ago. Um, and we've already been covered in Rolling Stone, the New York Times, LA Times, a variety um uh, the Hollywood Reporter, The Rap, I really could uh, miss magazine. I could go on for a long time on this. And part of what we bring to the table is a full service PR uh, firm with that actually gives you attention. And we don't charge pitch fees. We charge um, a percentage of press gotten uh, and it's capped at a frankly ridiculously low number and then we are also really really good at bridge booking and because we're really good at bridge booking uh and bridge booking is essentially short uh, like we know most of the independent theaters in the country and we call them up a couple weeks before uh, the actual booking is to start. We secure uh, the big markets, New York and L.A., further out. But after that, we start trying to get stuff closer because they find these theaters sometimes find themselves with holes in their schedule. So we just fill that hole. 
and it ends up meaning that we can do a 15 screen theatrical run nice on essentially on i think without paying a single rental fee i'll say that i don't want to say exactly what the pna spend is because that's separate mm -hmm. but we don't have to pay a single rental fee to the theater and that's so that's on, and that's built on relationships yeah. yeah so that's part of what we do we don't do a theatrical for everyone um we did like i said we did four last year we're kind of putting a little bit of a hiatus on it because we don't necessarily feel right pushing theatrical when we ourselves wouldn't go to a theater and there's just kind of a moral issue there. <laughs> yeah, like you, you're a butcher, but you're vegan. Like it's it's a rough. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, it's a rough so, sell. <laughs> so that's why we do that. But we, but even with that, we still do virtual cinema. We do. Um, we work with Mill Creek to set a release date. Some days we will do. Uh, so, or some films will do an early Amazon release before we do a wider physical and VOD release. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And uh, then we do our absolute damnedest to get it picked up by one of the big boys in pay TV. Um, right. We have a yeah. We've already got a film on Showtime. We have some others coming to some of the other people, but since they're not on there uh, and they haven't made an announcement yet, I'm not going to say who they are. Um, but for the right films, like this one I've alluded to a couple times that just closed today, some of the big theater chains still talk to us about getting a much wider release, and that is. Uh, and that's basically what we do for each film. And after, and depending on what we negotiate for pay TV, we'll uh, after that when the window allows us after the SVOD and pay TV window, we'll do AVOD. We've got a lot of contacts in that space too. But the big thing about Tubi is uh, you need to upload 100 films at a time right now, and that's why you kind of need to go through somebody if you're going to do it. So, gotcha. Yeah, you can't aggregate yourself onto Tubi. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you have 100 films you've directed, and then that's a conversation. <laughs> it's not as easy as you might think it is. And I hope you don't think it's easy. No, it's not. It's not at all, from what I understand. Now, the, the most important question I always I'd like to ask any, any distributor that I bring on to the show how do you pay filmmakers? So, we are. Um, different in this and this is something that kind of i wrote most of the mutiny contract myself and then our lawyer punched it up and then i went back and rewrote some of the lawyer bits and then we did that like three times but the uh basically we are we tend not to pay minimum guarantees uh just due to risk aversion the fact that we're still a small young company but but we structure our contract in such a way that filmmakers are paid from the first deal. So that is no, uh, we include a corridor that's equal to our commission in the first phase of the waterfall until we recoup. So that would be, uh, let's just say 25%. On commission right now, that's not always the case, but uh, that would mean we take 25% uh, after the uncapped and other recoupable expenses, and like the uncapped recoupable expenses, which would be things like DVD replication, would be a uncapped. Expense. Sure, because that, so, but that's a, but that's a sale, so you're only spending that money if money's coming in, so that makes sense. Yes, and then there's something like that too, and also we have a. Uh, blanket e &O policy that we uh, grant access to the filmmaker for, that we charge uh, a single flat fee the first time we deliver something that requires it. And that's and that, uh, yeah. probably cheaper than me going out and getting it myself. Yes. Uh, granted that this uh, thing is still, it's significantly cheaper. I've looked into it. Um, but the, uh, the other thing I would say there is in general, you might still want to get your own because ours is tailored to protect us and the buyer more than you. But generally, it. But yeah, so I would just say that for legal reasons. But the. Um, but it means that you are not required to do that under some deals, which you would like pay TV. You always need that, so that's why we do it that way. Um, the. 
And then the other level would be... So, right. Then it would be 25% to us, 25% to you, the filmmaker, and then the remaining 50% to our capped recoupable expenses, which uh, as of right now are... 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 15,000, depending on whether or not we do a, th- a uh, theatrical with it. And you're reporting all of those expenses and showing yeah. where, where you're spending money. Yes, we are. Um, and line item reporting even. So shocking. Are you kidding me? Stop it. <laughs> I just, I literally oh, just got off. I literally just got off the phone with a, 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 uh, um, a, uh, a filmmaker I was consulting about about this and they were like, Hey, I got this deal. Um, they want to, they want 40,000 expenses capped. Uh, and I'm like, but we asked them cause we watched your course, Alex. And we, we asked them for, are you going to report? And they're like, no, we're not going to tell you what we're spending our money on. So I'm like, they, like straight up. They're just like, yeah, we're not going to give you any reporting. It's like that. Come on. And it's, a, and by the way, it's a larger, it's a larger, um, it's one of the larger ones. Let's just put it. Shocking. Shocking, I say. It's, it's, the, um, lar- it's the larger one that we all know. and we'll, we'll, It's like Voldemort. We don't say the name. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, so I'm glad you do it. I'm glad you actually are yeah. doing reporting and things yeah. like that. So, so you seem to be a little bit more transparent than most distributors. Uh, yeah, we actually were kind of uh, founded on transparency. It's I don't think it's anywhere public, but uh, it's on a lot of internal documents as a brand and core value. So you should probably put it publicly. That probably is a good thing to do. You probably should. I just have like <laughs> not too many responsibilities. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Um, well, man, listen, man, it's been a pleasure, Ben, uh, talking to you. Um, where can people find out more about you and your company and what you do? Uh, so the best places to find out about us are, uh, mutinypictures.com and, uh, in general, most of my content right now is through medium, which is just, uh, Ben at mutiny. Mm-hmm dot medium.com okay fantastic ben it's a pleasure to talk to you as always sir and next time we talk the game will have changed again i'm sure wait we're talking next week yeah exactly (laughs) but uh, be well and stay safe man thanks for everything you do i want to thank ben for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs as i knew he would Thanks again, Ben. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 449. And if you haven't already, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. I really need your help to get better and better rankings for that darn algorithm to pick up this amazing content and help as many filmmakers as possible. And guys... The next episode will be episode 450. And I promise you that this episode is going to be one of the most epic episodes I have ever released. I've been teasing you guys about who is going to be this mystery guest. But it is going to be a whopper, I promise you. The only hint I will give you is he was one of those 1990s lottery ticket winning filmmakers who took off and blew up after screening at Sundance. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say anything else. You'll just have to wait till Thursday. Thank you guys again for listening so much. I love teasing you guys. This is great. I'm so excited about this episode. I can't even just contain myself. I want to tell you so badly, but don't worry. Thursday morning, you guys will know. Thanks again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 